Welcome back guys. Over the weekend, I shut the shop door, closed myself off from the outside world and really focused on trying to get some fabrication projects done. And while we're still waiting on a handful of parts and pieces that are back ordered, such as injectors, ignition coils, and some wiring parts, we're getting dangerously close to getting to fire this thing up and I could not be more excited about it. I got the throttle body mounted to the intake manifold. I got our intercooler end tanks tacked together and the intercooler is now in the car and I got the last charge pipe that bridges those two components together and our TurboSmart blow-off valve is mounted into place. So the engine bay on this thing is really coming together. I'm liking the way that it looks. There's still a bit of work left to go and we've got to build an exhaust, but we are closing in on that finish line. We'll also hop in the car and talk about the headliner conundrum. You guys had a ton of suggestions and I think I have some ideas on how we're gonna conquer it and get me to fit inside of this car without too much of an issue. And last but not least, by the time this episode comes out, I should be really close to 75,000 subscribers. And while that's not a ton in the scope of YouTube itself, it's a ton to me. I can't believe so many of you guys are supporting this channel and keep coming back to see this build come to life. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should, because that kind of support helps me out a bunch and it makes sure that I can continue to focus on making content just like this. We've got the 308 project underway. We're diving into the Model A later this week, and I've got another new project to show you guys that we'll be diving into soon, and I'm excited to see what you guys think. With all that out of the way, let's dive in. A few weeks ago, we made some really good progress on our water to air intercooler. I designed and fabricated end tanks for both sides of it, but we only have one on it, and that's because I had my buddy Dan come over and weld it up. The reason being is that I'm an amateur aluminum welder and this intercooler is gonna be front and center in the engine bay. I want it looking as good as possible. I'm not afraid to call in some help when I want a product that is beyond my own capabilities or expectations and Dan was the perfect fit. This time around though, Dan's not around to weld this thing up. So I'm gonna get it assembled and tack welded so we can make some forward progress. I spent some time cleaning up all of the material since it needs to be perfect before we can actually weld it. And then I got all of our panels lined up and secured into place with some tape. It took some time to make sure all of the gaps were closed up and positioned correctly, but eventually I got it right where I wanted it. It was a bit of a trial and error process, making sure that the parts didn't move around because of course, as welding and heat are introduced, things do tend to wiggle, bend, or distort. I used one of my biggest C-clamps to help persuade this thing to stay put as I welded it up. With the three sides all tacked into place, I needed to focus on building a faceplate, which includes a three inch hole and a three inch vibrant HD clamp ferrule. An HD clamp means we don't have to use something like a silicone coupler, but we can still get some flexibility to allow for things like engine movement and tubing expansion. I clamped this faceplate to a piece of wood and stuck it in the drill press so that we can put a three inch hole in it. As most people know, drilling big holes in sheet metal is never very easy, and this is the best way that I've found to do it so far. Although one side is only tacked together, I'm happy to see this thing really coming to life and taking shape. With it tacked together, we can make some forward progress and start building the tube work that will bridge this to the throttle body. And that's what our main goal is here. I'll have a buddy come back later and actually weld this thing up so that it looks good, unless I absolutely have to do it myself. We'll just have to see how this goes. But overall, I'm happy with how this is turning out. This thing's gonna need several mounts to hold it securely in place as we're running around the racetrack in the future. And for a foundational support, I chucked some material in the old sketchy lathe in the corner of the shop and began turning down a pedestal foot. I still have no idea what I'm actually doing with the lathe, but I love opportunities to hop onto it and try making something. And here's what we got. Now here's our finished piece. And the way this is going to work is it's going to drop into our tube bung here that is for bolting the transmission to this cross brace. And it will simply drop in. And this side will be welded to the bottom of the intercooler. And it will just do all of the heavy support because that thing's gonna be full of water. And this will definitely support that weight. It's nice and thick. And then what we'll do from there is simply locate it, keep it from moving around by doing some brackets, whether it's from here or from some of these mounts. We'll keep it in place 
and use this for our heavy lifting. Now, some of you guys might remember a number of episodes ago, I started making an adapter plate for us to mount our throttle body to our intake manifold because it does not bolt into these Honda specific bolt patterns here. Well, I gave up on this plan because it was clear it was gonna overlap and cause problems, but a buddy reached out on Instagram and told me he was working on adapter of his own, and so I bought it. And I presume this probably works great on a factory manifold, but it did not work on this one. This is eight millimeter bolts, and this one was set up for six millimeter, if you notice the smaller ends of these slots here. So I had to spend the last number of hours, honestly, uh, machining this. My buddy Brett helped me and let me use his mill, and we opened up the holes and added some depth to them to allow eight millimeter bolts to fit. And now we can actually bolt this guy onto here, and then it has a secondary adapter, goes on there, and then the throttle body will fit on. So I'm going to get these pieces bolted on and put the throttle body on so we can start figuring out intake tubing. Now when it comes to final assembly of the car, this will need gaskets between these parts, but right now we're just trying to get progress done, so we'll worry about that later. Ignoring the problems of adapting this adapter to my own manifold, Grid Composites did a really nice job on this part, so if you're looking for something similar, definitely reach out to him. It took all of the guesswork out of mounting our Bosch Motorsport drive-by-wire throttle body, and overall I'm excited about how this is coming together. I took the opportunity to put our intercooler into the engine bay sitting atop the mount we just made in order to get an idea of what needs to come next because we do need to bridge the throttle body to that HD clamp ferrule that we put on the outlet of the intercooler. So the only two we have left is to go from the throttle body to this HD clamp here. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not as simple straight of a shot as it looks. Uh, this is in the way, and we could move it, but then I'd have to find a completely new place for it. Uh, and on top of that, these are not in plane with each other anyways. I can't put this high enough in order to have it meet this effectively. So we might as well just do some fancy jogging and try to come out quickly uh, and kind of jog around our catch can and into this. So. I guess somebody out there is gonna say, why don't you just move that and make it as simple as possible, but I like a challenge. Now we're gonna be fabricating this tube out of a bunch of bent pieces of aluminum, and we'll be cutting them as needed in order to chain them together to get from point A to point B. These are just my leftovers and scraps, but this gives you an idea of how this is actually done. Most of these bends come as 90 or 180 degrees, and they'll run through the bandsaw to get us what we want. Now, while I'm cutting tube, I wanted to take a moment and explain one of the challenges you'll face if you tackle a project like this, and it's cutting tube work perpendicular to the bend, wherever you want it to be. And it sounds easy on the surface to run it through the bandsaw correctly, but this is enough of a challenge they actually sell specialized tools to help you do this. Now, to see what it looks like when it's correct, this is a give or take 30 degree bend, and I cut it, correctly. And you can tell because if we go and mate the pieces together, it's a nice smooth transition. This could be positioned in any way that we want and it will look appropriate when welded. This could be going from, you know, a throttle body to, you know, an intercooler or what have you. But when it's cut incorrectly, it's what's known as a cheater cut. And I have one here to show you guys. This is not correct. It's not cut on the center line, it's actually quite off. It's at a random angle. And if we go and put these pieces together, you'll see that it really looks quite poor. This would look bad welded into a car, or if we flip it around, let's say we needed to jog around something. It just doesn't quite look right. I hope you guys can see that on camera. It's kind of hard to see. But the other problem at hand is that it's also now an ovular hole because it's not cut straight. And so if we were to line up the bottoms of these, you'll see that there is a hole at the top and that's not gonna be easy to weld up. So overall, you really want to avoid situations like this and you want to run your part through the bandsaw 
correctly, always aiming from the blade to the center point of that bend, the center line of that radius, which would be about right here. After a couple of hours of cutting bits and pieces of tube to get all of the bends and curves just right, I wound up with something that's going to work. All of the segments in this tube have to be indexed and clocked correctly in order for it to line up once it's done. So I made a series of marks on each piece before welding them together. It's also helpful to put a number on the inside of each tubing segment to make sure you don't get them out of order if you take them apart on the workbench. And I say that from firsthand experience. And here you have it, the finished piece all tacked together. And I'm really pleased with how it came out. If you notice, there's even a three to three and a half inch transition in the middle of it, which steps our tubing size up to meet the throttle body. As you can see, it fits well in the car and it jogs around our catch can. And I think the extra effort was worthwhile. But we're not done yet. We still need to place our blow off valve on this thing. There's a lot of discussion out there about where is best to place a blow off valve, but I've decided in our case, I want it as close to the throttle body as I can get it. Actually plunging a hole saw through this part was absolutely nerve wracking because as said, I spent a lot of time on this thing and it would have been a huge bummer to mangle it as the hole saw went through. But thankfully I didn't encounter any issues. And after a bit of trimming and buzzing with an arbor bit, I got our blow off valve flange to fit up nicely. I had to get crafty with a clamp in order to hold the flange into place as I tacked it on. I didn't want a tack on one side to lift the other and give me a gap I couldn't weld in the future. With the flange in place, let's talk a little bit about my choice of blow off valve. As mentioned, I'm using the TurboSmart Raceport, and I'm quite fortunate that TurboSmart was willing to partner up on this build because they make one of the best blow-off valves money can buy. Not only is it one of the most lightweight and smallest blow-off valves in its class, it also has some of the highest flow at 330 cubic feet per minute, meaning this thing is more than adequate enough at the 1000 horsepower mark we're aiming for. With the charge piping all wrapped up, it's time to install the Vibrant HD clamps and get this thing all mounted into place. The complete charge pipe system with the blow-off valve installed looks incredible in the engine bay, and this offers the first time I've been able to step back and look at the entire charge air system complete. I do think that the intercooler itself needs something else to really spice it up and have it look the part in the engine bay, considering how much of a focal point it is, but I'm really happy with how the engine bay is looking overall. All right, I'm hungry, time for a quick snack break, and I think the dog agrees. You want a treat? All right, come on. No, this way, come here. All right, what are you in the mood for? Do you want a crocodile, or you want a toothbrush, or a stick? Crocodile? Okay. All right, so that's a lot of the tube work in the back of the car done. Really all that we have left is some fluid plumbing and then the exhaust side of things. So let's jump back into the cabin of the car and talk about that headliner because there were a lot of comments on the last episode and I've got some thoughts to share with you guys. Back in the car, I've removed the headliner as you guys can see. And unfortunately I did that off camera, but imagine me drilling out six rivets and it popping right out. It's pretty easy. I wanna give you guys a good look at what it looks like under here because I talked about it in the last episode and talk about what I'm thinking for a solution about it because some of you guys said I should leave the headliner in and have like a removable panel above my head, but 
I don't think that's the right way to go. I don't think it would look very good. Some of you guys said put a gurney bubble on the roof. I'm definitely not gonna do that. I'd rather cut the floor and send me downwards than move the roof up. Uh, I, I don't think a gurney bubble would look right on the car. It would kind of disrupt the lines, and after all, that's why I bought this thing. I think I'm gonna have to do some sort of covering on this, but unfortunately, it's ugly, so let's take a look at it. At the front of the roof is the most obvious steel structure, and while it's not pretty, I do think this might be a good place for me to tie in a mount for that can pad control panel. This would be nice and accessible and easy to make. It's also the least offensive looking part of the interior because if we look at the A pillars, we can see sheet metal MIG welded to a tube structure that runs from the base of the A pillar to the back of the C pillar. And it's anything but pretty to look at. Getting to the back of the cabin, we'll see the worst part of this thing. And it's the rear corners of the roof. There's a lot of spray on adhesive deadener going on here and a lot of metal that's scabbed in and it's just really offensive to look at, at least for me. It's the one part of the interior roof that I really feel like we need to work hard to hide because I do not want to look at this when I'm getting in the car. But just like we came up with our own carpet, I have an idea for the roof. So I think we can do something with this, you know, using some maybe different fabrics, maybe some foam to cover up some stuff and then using more of our carpet. The downside at hand though is, is my roll bar is not gonna fit the way that I want it to anymore. It hugged the headliner really nice and tight and it won't anymore. I'm gonna redo the roll bar because otherwise it's gonna bug me forever. So we'll have that in an upcoming episode. Fortunately, it shouldn't take too long. All my base plates, things like that, will stay the same. It's just a matter of redoing the hoop and the diagonals, uh, things like that. But it's another thing on the list, all in the name of I want it to be right. I want it to look good. And I know that roll bar will bug me having a gap above the, above the top of the bar. Otherwise, I think I've got a game plan together. As mentioned in the last episode, we're relatively close to finishing the car up in here. I've still got to figure out door cards and some other stuff, but I feel good about the lay of the land in here. Back to the front of the car. And there we have it, another episode finished up. I hope you guys enjoyed the progress. It felt like I got a lot done, but forgot to film some of it. So hopefully it panned out. For the next episode, I'm hopeful that we're gonna get the end tanks on the intercooler all finished up, and that we will finalize all of the plumbing on the 308 and start getting some fluids into it. Fingers crossed. That should mean that aside from wiring, all that's left is building the exhaust for the engine before we can run it. And I'm gonna order up the material. Maybe we'll get to that too with a little bit of luck. On the Model A front, the engine is supposed to be here tomorrow, so I'm hopeful that on Friday's episode, we will get the engine back into the Model A, filled with fluids. We'll add some new fuel lines and really have this thing close to firing up. We're gonna need a management system, which Haltech has signed on and has said they're gonna to try to get us one of their Coyote standalone Elite 2500 setups, and I'm pretty excited about that. It should make the whole process a lot easier. It's gonna be a bunch of progress over there, so make sure you guys come back. I'll catch you guys at the end of the week. Thanks as always for the support.